We've been announcing for several weeks now, pray for the leadership retreat. It was in the announcements tonight. It's on the, the prayer sheet that we uh, handed out. And the Spirit of God has directed tonight's message in a, a fashion that prayerfully will help us pray in general, but pray specifically for the leadership retreat, uh, not in a, a rote fashion, but in a manner that will lead to rejoicing. And the Lord, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, uh, warned against uh, praying vain repetitions, and sometimes the things we ask you to pray for can come across almost as just an administrative announcement. Sign up in the foyer, whether you're going to bring a dessert or a salad, for the fellowship meal next Lord's Day, pray for the leadership retreat. Uh, don't forget to not stick your gum under the pews in here. It, not that anyone does that, but uh, you get the picture. So tonight we're going to be in this second letter that Paul was moved to the Spirit to write to the church in Corinth. Don't turn there yet because we're going to back up a little bit to the first letter. I want to give you a, a little bit of historical context, not just to preach biblically, hermeneutically correct, although that's certainly always the desire uh, of a preacher. But because uh, I don't want this to be a, even an administrative sort of sermon. You know, we came on a Wednesday night and we, we sing, we, we hear preaching, da 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 uh, Here were his three points. They were alliterated, they weren't alliterated. Why weren't they alliterated? They were alliterated, but they were awful alliterations. Now, I want you to get in the mind of, in the heart of Paul the Apostle as he's writing to this church, because our message tonight is going to be making an application of Paul the Evangelist and his, his uh, team. And the letter, second letter begins identifying Timothy as being a primary partner at that point, co-laborer, as they're writing to this church in Corinth. And so I don't just want to set dates and and events, although we're going to look at events, but I want to get to um, eventually a text <laughs> in the, the second letter that he wrote to the church in Corinth with an understanding of uh, prayerfully Paul's heart. And again, we're going to make an application of that then to uh, a relationship between the, the uh, pastors of a church and the people of a church. And so the interpretation will always be clear is that it's uh, Paul was not pastoring the church in Corinth. He did pastoral work. They were sheep without a shepherd. He rolled into town, went there, we don't know how many times, and uh, evangelized, did some discipleship. And, and so uh, even though he was an evangelist, we're going to make an application of, of a, a pastor or pastors of a church with, with the people of the church. So that's kind of where we're headed. At the end of the first letter, uh, chapter 16, you can, can turn there, uh, so 1 Corinthians chapter 16, the last chapter, uh, this letter, uh, the first letter was written from Ephesus, and Ephesus is in Asia, we say Asia biblically, not thinking of the continent of Asia, we think of the Roman province of Asia, so we're thinking modern day Turkey, so when he's writing and he mentions Asia, think, well, Ephesus was a major city where Paul had been that he's writing from, so he, he references Asia, but you can kind of think in your mind Paul is referencing when he was in uh, Ephesus. So he's writing this first letter to the, the church in Corinth in uh, verses 7 through 9 there, chapter 16, from Ephesus, he says, for I will not see you now, by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you, if the Lord permit." But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. And perhaps we do, we're doing Q&A and you felt comfortable speaking back to me, which congregations typically don't, at least not in this environment. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I would say, well, what's this great big effectual door that's, that's open? Why is he saying you know, my heart is to want to come and be with you, saints in, in Corinth, but I'm not, uh, you know, Lord willing, I'll, I'll come and spend some time with you, but I have this, this great door and effectual that's open to me here. Well, what's going on here in 
Asia, what's going on here specifically in Ephesus? And Larry's thinking, I know, in his mind he's saying, if I really thought I had liberty, I would shout out some answers right now. And you would say, well, maybe, he, he even mentions one of them right here, uh, I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. So religious festival, religious gathering, Jews celebrating uh, Pentecost. There, and I can't remember my original source. My source for tonight is a previous devotional that I did with the SPGs many, many years ago uh, using this, this text. And in my studies back then, not only were, uh, was there a religious gathering for Pentecost for, for the Jews, there was a musical gathering, seemed to be like a month-long music fest of sorts. And then maybe the one that Larry's thinking, some sort of athletic competition, some uh, gymnastics, or maybe you're thinking in an earlier version of, of the Olympics. And all these things seem to come together in Ephesus around uh, the month of, of May. And so Paul's saying all these different events overlap on the calendar and people are coming into town for different reasons. Huge open door. Why would I leave right now when all these souls are gathering here? So he's, he's talking about that. And then he says, oh, by the way, where there's an open door, there are many adversaries. What a loaded statement that was. And to see how loaded that statement is, turn now to the book of Acts. We're going to come back to, well, really, the end of 1 Corinthians and roll into 2 Corinthians. But if you turn to Acts chapter 19, uh, we're still trying to set the stage for some of the things that Paul is going to say in his, his second letter to these saints Acts chapter 19, I'll begin in verse 23, and this is going to link up with what he said to them. Hey, I'm, I want to come to you, but I have this door of opportunity, masses of people to evangelize, and Satan's not going to sit back and say, go ahead, Paul, uh, get the gospel out to as many people as you can. He's going to fight back, and so there are many adversaries. So now we read about some of the adversaries there in Ephesus, uh, verse 23 of Acts 19, and the same time there arose no small stir about that way for a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of all uh, of like occupation and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, ye see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. And we would say, well, amen. <laughs> uh, so that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion. And having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. And when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the theater. I was thinking, well, that'd be a good message just unto itself. Don't adventure to thyself in, into the theater. Amen, said all God's people. Uh, but that's, of course, not, not the case. It wasn't strolling down to whatever the theater in town is or the one I drive by outside uh, in the rain, people pulling in to sit and watch garbage out of Hollywood in, in the rain. Not that kind of, kind of theater. This was an angry mob that had been whipped up into a frenzy that seemed ready to just shred Paul to, to pieces. And so Acts uh, chapter 20, the first verse says, After the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them and departed for to go into where? Just wondering if anyone actually turned there with me. <laughs> Macedonia. Macedonia. And so now we take our thoughts to Paul's second letter 
that he's writing to the church in Corinth, which was written from, take a wild guess, starts with an M and ends in Macedonia, Macedonia. And you'd say, well, Pastor Guys, prove that to us. I'm not going to prove that to you. I say, just read the letter and see how many times he references Macedonia. Study those times and say, hmm, he must have been writing from Macedonia. So we'll just take that from, uh, from my studies. So with that uh, biblical context, historical context, him writing the first time from Ephesus, what happened in Ephesus, getting, you could say, chased out of Ephesus, he, he would have stayed. He would have just lunged into the crowd if his friends wouldn't have pulled him out of there. So his friends, once again, you know, it seems like a common theme we have with Paul. He just preaches truth, and God, or, uh, God loves it. The God of this world hates it. <laughs> Satan and, and foments a rebellion, and, and Paul's friends say, let's, let's get you out of here to preach on an, another day. And so he leaves Ephesus, goes to Macedonia, and writes uh, this second letter. And so we're going to be in uh, chapter 1, picking up in verse 8 now. Verse 8, chapter 1, 2 Corinthians. And this is what we have perfectly preserved for us here in, in the Word of God. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia. So we all get that now, right? Well, what he's speaking about? He's speaking about Ephesus, which is in Asia, great big door opened, many adversaries to include all the people making money off of making idols and shrines to Diana. So that's what he's referencing. Uh, and he says, I, I want you to know why or what just happened to me back, back there, even though now I'm writing to you from Macedonia. So, which came to us in Asia that we were pressed out of measure above strength inasmuch that we despaired even of life and you could say well, I didn't necessarily get that out of where we were reading well you piece it all together and you say it wasn't just Paul saying hey it was pretty bad they yelled at me they they called me some names and I was going to stay and maybe debate them but my friend said no nah, it's better if you get out of town no he's saying in this letter back there where we just came from we thought we were going to die Literally. But we had, verse 9, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. And you probably heard a message preached uh, from this next verse, verse 10, who delivered us from so great a death. And that's great, just pulled out of context, no context at all. We can just take it and apply it and preach it and say that's an incredible truth. But you put it in the context and it, it, it has prayerfully even more significance and then more so when you would then make it an application to your own lives. Anyway, so who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. And I purposed to write a sila on my notes, even though hopefully the way I was grammatically phrasing it, you said, well, you didn't kind of come to the end of a sentence. And then you look down and you say, well, he didn't because it's not in the end of the sentence. There's a period. There's not a period there. There's a semicolon. If I uh, cut and pasted right in my, my notes. And I, and I don't want to go on to complete the sentence until you have very much settled in your minds and in your hearts and in your souls the significance of what Paul is saying in verse 10. We thought we were going to die, and yet the one we sang about, this, uh, you know, he's able to deliver me, you know, doo -doo -doo, it was kind of happy, peppy, Wednesday night. But take that song and apply it to what Paul is saying here. You know, he delivered us from so great a death. Could anyone else have delivered... Paul from death, you might say, well, well, yeah, his friends did. And no, we read historically what his friends were doing. Hey, it's not, no, Paul, don't go into the theater. No, it, crazy things will happen. His friends, and, and Paul saying, 
okay, they were part of it, but God, <laughs> the, the deliverer, delivered us from this, this death, and he's, gonna, he's the same ongoing deliverer. He doth deliver, and, and we press forward in our labors for the Lord wherever he directs us, uh, trusting that he will yet deliver us. No one else but the deliverer can deliver from death. And even when Paul was sacrificed his very life, when, when God said, time to come home, I want you up here, there was still a deliverance, was there not? Uh, okay, he lost his physical death, but he was delivered unto eternal life. <laughs> And so even in, in physical death, there's a deliverance from, from death, you know? The end of the resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, but we won't go there. So can you, can you understand that Paul's saying, there's no one in this world but my almighty God, the deliverer, that did deliver me from death, is doing it ongoing, and will do it in the future. Are we all there? Okay. So I was like, yeah, keep praying. We want to hear what's happening next. Okay. With that in mind, semicolon, saints in Corinth, ye also helping together by prayer for us. And I have to stop there because this is the whole message. I could just say this and throw out the rest of my notes and you'd all cheer but um, prayerfully that makes us stop and think is us praying one for another that significant is it more significant than, significant than pray for the leadership retreat next service pray for the leadership retreat yeah pray for the pastors pray for the people going away uh Paul said, God delivers from death, but in addition to that, there's help I get from your, your prayers. And I feel like I don't even need to preach anymore because um, we should just <laughs> pray right now for um, uh, your pastors, Pastor Sergeant, who's already away seeking the Lord's face. Um, And not even in relation to the leadership retreat, just thinking about prayer. Prayers one for another in the body of Christ. I read verse 10, and it was so familiar to me. And then I read, read verse 11 in, in that first phrase, and it just stopped me in my tracks. It's one of those times you ought not to say, I have to read three or four chapters today because it's, it's on my reading list. You ought to just stop and take what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about, and meditate on it, and just sh shut your Bible and, and let it uh, marinate in your heart and in your soul and in your life and change you. And that's what I pray will happen tonight as we continue on. Uh, a little more context, this letter he's writing uh, over and over again to the church saying, uh, I didn't take anything from you. I came in. I didn't say, pay me and I'll preach. Uh, he says, I got money from these other churches. And because they were meeting my needs, I was able to come into to Corinth and, and preach the gospel to you and be without charge. And, and it's just a theme that comes back repeatedly throughout the uh, the letter, which helps give context for what he's saying here as we continue to read verse 11. That uh, he also, helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, and again, throughout the letter he references all these other churches, churches in Macedonia that are meeting his needs. Thanks may be given by many on our behalf. Uh, for our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you word. And think about what Paul is saying there. 
I don't mean to get ahead of myself, but who cares about an outline that's pretty much gone out the window tonight? So conversation we know is not just tap, 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 tap. It's the, our, the affairs of life, just the way we're living. And he's talking about the way he was living in the world in general, but, but especially he's writing to these uh, heart to heart, uh, the saints in, in Corinth, more abundantly to you word. For we write none other things unto you than what ye read or acknowledge, and I trust ye shall acknowledge even to the end, as also ye have acknowledged us in part, that we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours, are what? Our rejoicing in the day of the Lord Jesus. And we'll stop there for a text because there's plenty, obviously. And so here's the the thesis, if I haven't made it clear already. We trust God's delivering resurrection power. But we can also help each other by prayer. And again, our text is 8 to 13, but really it's 10 to the beginning of 11. God delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us that to me just seems the be-all, end-all. What else could there be? <laughs> and to answer what I think is a rhetorical question, the answer is, ye also helping together by prayer for us. And uh, praying for the leadership retreat should not be, it cannot be, uh, the simple recitation of a bullet on tonight's handout. It can't be. And so, again, making application of Paul an evangelist, writing to a a church, Uh, our application is going to be the pastors of a church and and the the church members. So outline, if if I follow it really, it's just preaching through the text, would be the first uh, few verses, verses 8 through 10, the pastors. Uh, Again, in the text, it would be the evangelists, but those ministering to, to a flock. Uh, Verses 11 and 12 would be the prayers, not the prayers, but the people that are praying, the prayers. And I googled, is there a word for people that pray? And there is. It's an obsolete word that I'd never heard before and we don't use in the English language, but I'll tell it to you anyway, because it's also another P. Uh, Precants, P-R-E-C-A-N-T-S. Has anyone ever heard that term? A precant, someone who prays? I didn't think so. It's, what's it, have you heard of that? Yeah? Okay, so we have pastors and then ones who are praying, the prayers or precants if you want to impress your friends. Although our friends probably wouldn't be impressed by that. Uh, that'll be verses 11 and 12. And then the partnership between the two, which is verses 13 and, and 14. So when we get to our prayer time, I'm, I'm not directing you away from everything else on your prayer sheet tonight. However, uh, the message is, is, uh, that the Lord has directed is, is certainly designed to enable us uh, to pray for a specific thing during our prayer time, and that would be uh, the leadership retreat, Pastor Sergeant, myself, the others that will be going up there. So the pastors, verses uh, 8 to 10, Uh, Paul says, I I don't want you to be ignorant, and this is kind of interesting, of of the troubles we went through. And I thought about that. There is so much uh, I'm not inviting a pity party here. I'm just trying to state a reality. Uh, There are so many things that the, the church to a large extent Um, things that we are ignorant of, the troubles that that pastors sometimes go through. Uh, Your pastors, uh, Pastor Sergeant, myself, I don't think I come and knock on your door every time, you know, someone uh, sends an email or or calls or opens the door and and throws in a hand grenade with the the pin pulled. Um, You deal with them. Um, and so I find it interesting here, there are so many things, <laughs> and, and I would say even as one of your pastors, uh, there are things that Pastor Sargent deals with that I'm ignorant of, 
he doesn't come running to me. Oh, you wouldn't believe how awful day I had as the senior pastor of this church, uh, Brother Geist. Uh, <laughs> there are things I'm ignorant of. And, and, and so I just find it interesting that Paul, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit impressed Paul in this letter to say, I, I, just want, I don't want you to be ignorant of some of the things I just went through in, in Ephesus. And it wasn't to bring a pity party on Paul. In fact, quite the contrary in our text. He's really saying it to bring glory to God as the great deliverer and then to say, I really want you to pray for us because on top of God being the ultimate deliverer, uh, ye also helping together by prayer for us. We, we need your help. Again, that blows me away. God provides all and yet he's begging for the prayers of, of the saints in, in, in Corinth. And so he says, I don't want you to be ignorant. We were pressed out of measure and above strength. And if you have a little plaque at home uh, or a meme on your, it's the background of your work computer or something or on your smartphone or a smartphone case, something that says, God will never give you more than you can handle. Uh, get rid of it because it's unbiblical and you're blaspheming the word of God. <laughs> And I've probably said that before. Maybe you've said that. It kind of cute. It sounds cute. Maybe there's a kitten on there, hanging on for dear life, and uh, you know, and it's something you would give your secret prayer sister as a, as a gift, because you thought, saw it down at the at the Christian bookstore or something. God will never give you more than you can handle. That's a lie, <laughs> and it's proven to be a lie right here in the Word of God. God purposely gives you more than you can handle so that you have to rely on, on him. And, and you're mature Christians. I think you know that. So it's just a good reminder to don't fall into that trap. Oh, God will never give me more than I can handle. Uh, yeah, he, he can and does uh, that we might uh, rest upon him. Later in this letter, Paul says, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. If he, if he never gave you more than you could handle, then you would constantly be in a state of being able to handle everything in your own strength. And we'd all be a bunch of puny weaklings because we'd only be relying on our strength and not be forced to rely upon the strength of the Almighty One, <laughs> the Almighty God who spoke this world into existence. And and created you and I. And so beyond the thought that a little cutesy poster that might say that is, is blatantly unscriptural, and Paul proves it to the contrary, I thought perhaps this is one of the greatest secrets of Paul's success. Constantly being pressed out of measure and above strength. And... Uh, there have been times in 2021 that I've been pressed out of measure and above strength uh, dealing with things in the ministry at, at Bible Baptist Church, and I, uh, I give glory to God for doing that in my life. Because if there has been absolutely nothing in 2021 that I couldn't handle as, as a pastor on my plate, then I would be wimp, a, a wimp because I would be doing everything in my own strength. And compared to God's strength, that's not very much. And so I praise the Lord that, that he's done that for me and uh, I'm, uh, would be willing to assert Pastor Sargent would give testimony of, of the same thing in, in his life, some of the things that he's had to deal with this, uh, this past year. Um, for me, that I should not trust in myself but in, in God, just as, as Paul said. Uh, Paul said they despaired of, of even uh, their lives, uh, as far as I know, your pastors have not received death threats this year, at least not that I'm aware of. Uh, if there have been any directed at me, they need to be a little more bold because I don't know about it. <laughs> I don't live out there in the social media world where maybe those threats would, would appear. Uh, but there have been threats to destroy this church. And uh, I would take that, and I do take that personally, so... No, a death threat hasn't been made to me. Um, but on behalf of God, I, I take offense that someone would want to destroy Bible Baptist Church. And I uh, like to believe that I'll be a soldier under the end fighting against those, those forces of Satan. Um, 
Paul said that there was, per, again, purpose in his death sentence. <laughs> and that was that uh, his, he and his team, uh, again, at the beginning of the letter, he specifically mentions uh, Timothy as a co-laborer here at this phase of his life. Um, the purpose of the death sentence was to uh, not be trusting in, in self. In chapter 11 of, the, of this, this letter, verse 23, he says, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent. And then these three words, in deaths oft. So we're just looking at one little snippet of historical context of the troubles that he's revealing to them of what just happened in Asia, in in, uh, Ephesus, that he's referring to. But later on in the letter, he says, oh yeah, in deaths oft. I don't, again, I don't think I've ever received a, a death threat and he was often being threatened and physically harmed un, unto a death. Another place where uh, you'd be uh, best meditating on those three words than trying to rip through three chapters in, in your, your reading and, and balance that with, I do follow a reading schedule and even if I meditate and stop on, on three words uh, for, for an hour or so, uh, I'll go back and finish because I, I feel it's important for me and for you and for every Christian to be washed by the water of the word and, and read through cover to cover over and over and over again. It's not one or the other, it's, it's both. It's both. Uh, he says in chapter 4 of this, this epistle, this, this same letter, verses uh, 8 through 12, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed. Is anyone perplexed even just today? <laughs> any time in 2021 perplexed but not in despair persecuted but not forsaken cast down but not destroyed always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body for we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus sake that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. And that's another Selah moment to just get a feel for the heart Paul had for Bible Baptist Church of, of Corinth. And uh, the team was not hopeless because of this uh, deliverer. He delivered, past tense, us from so great a death. There in Ephesus, where Paul was almost mauled to death. In Lystra, where Paul was stoned to death. And he mentions it later in the letter in chapter 11. Once was I stoned. (laughs) Just a passing comment and a long list of other things in the letter. Oh yeah, there was that time I was stoned to death. Um, supposing he had been dead, <laughs> howbeit as the disciples stood around about him, he rose up. Read about that in Acts chapter uh, 14. How about there in, in Corinth? He's writing to the saints in Corinth. Were there any times in, in Corinth where he was delivered? Good, good question to uh, rhetorically ask to lead me to read from Acts chapter 18, verses 9 to 16, where he was there in Corinth. He says, then spake the Lord to Paul, I guess Luke writing here, then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them, and when Gallio was the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was now open, uh, about to open his mouth, Gallio said unto the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason would that I should bear with you. But if it be a question of words and names and of your law, look ye to it. 
for I will be no judge of such matters. And he drave them from the judgment seat. You'd say, well, Gallio saved him. No, God saved him. <laughs> and yeah, God works through, through people and circumstances, but God's the one that de delivered time and time and time again in Paul's life. He said he doth deliver. It's the same God today as, as yesterday. I'm the Lord, I change not. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. He says uh, in chapter 6, verse 9, as dying and behold, we live as chastened and not killed. And then you have the perspective, will yet deliver. But wait a minute, Paul ultimately did lose his head, we believe, as a martyr, did he not? So the deliverer failed at that point. He said, he, he, you're all shaking your heads saying, no, that's right. He delivered even beyond death, and more importantly, beyond the death. What if he has us give our lives for the cause of Christ uh, before three score and ten? Would you say, I'll testify that God will deliver me, but if not, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Amen. Can we testify as Esther? If I perish, I perish. He's still a deliverer. He delivered, he doth deliver, and he will yet deliver, even unto death and, and beyond death. For me, to live is Christ, and to, to die, that's gain, as he wrote to the church in, in Philippi. Uh, bottom line from, from the, drawing the parallel from Paul, an evangelist to your pastors. Uh, pastors prayerfully mimic Paul in this attitude with a complete reliance on the deliverer. Uh, and then, again, the foot stomping over and over again, the main message tonight, in addition to that. How can there be any addition to that? I don't know, but it's here in the text in Paul writing to them. God's going to deliver me. He delivered. He, he uh, is delivering. He doth deliver. He'll deliver in the future. But beyond that, I want help of your, your prayers for us. Ye also helping together by prayer for us. Uh, then verse 12, for our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience that in simplicity and godly sincerity not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God we have had our conversation to, in the world and more abundantly to uh, you word. There is a symbiotic, um, mutually beneficial within the body, symbiotic relationship between uh, your pastors and the prayers. Does anyone want to use precance? Other than Mrs. Webster, she said she's heard the word before. Uh, between the pastors and the prayers, you'd say, well, don't, don't the pastors pray for us? Isn't that what they're supposed to do? You're saying we're supposed to pray for that? Yes, all of the, all of the above. Uh, Acts chapter 6, you might be familiar with. The deacons, or at least most of the deacons, will be going to the leadership retreat based on schedules. I can't remember who else, maybe not able to make it due to work, but... Um, why do we have deacons? Why do they have deacons in Jerusalem as the church was just exploding and the, and the, the leadership of the church, the, the pastors are running around serving tables and they don't have time to study the word of God to preach and they don't have time to, to pray because they're, you know, the, the Grecian women or whatever, they were complaining, oh, we're not getting fed. <laughs> so, so they sought out, uh, and I can't quote the passage off the top of my head, Good men, holy men of God, filled with, filled with the Holy Ghost. And they had got uh, diakonos, deacons, servants, to handle some of the temporal, physical uh, needs of the church. And they said, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So it's silly to, to even question, well, are, are the pastors supposed to pray for the church? I, I, absolutely. Acts chapter 6 and, and verse, verse 4 and, and all sorts of other places in, in the New Testament. And, and yet, uh, it's, again, it's symbiotic, praying one for another. Ye also helping 
together, helping together by prayer for us. A union of togetherness, uh, helping, laboring, toiling in prayer. Uh, Paul referenced Epaphras when he's writing to a different church, uh, the one in Colossae. He says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you. Maybe not that kind of salute. Uh, saluteth you always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Uh, and so this uh, ye also helping together has a sense of this laboring fervently, working, laboring in, in prayer. That's not... I'm not making fun of the, the announcements tonight. tonight. Uh, I think you understand that. It's not pray for the leadership retreat. It's labor fervently and passionately working, <laughs> exerting uh, in, in prayer. Why? Because even though God is the ultimate deliverer that's in control and will deliver, there's a helping together that comes from 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 prayers. Uh, this symbiotic relationship is the, the laboring together fervently in, in prayers one for another, helping one another, this togetherness. And then the other, other aspect of the, it sounds kind of weird, it's just a normal word, symbiotic, right? I don't use it five times a day in a sentence, but, but this mutual, mutually beneficial relationship within the body that we have one for another you know, praying one for another, and then the other aspect would be in this this concept of conversation. Paul referenced the way we live in this in this world, and then more abundantly, or especially however he said it, to you word. And take that both both ways. The way your pastors and the leadership of the church are to have their conversations in the world, and more abundantly to you word. And then the same thing backwards. You see, prayerfully, it's beneficial both ways. If, if you see uh, uh, the right conversation, manner of life, state of affairs of, of your pastors in the world and to you word, prayerfully that's encouraging to you because I know the reverse way, it's, it's uh, magnificently encouraging to me when I see someone living a, a, a godly life in the world and to us were uh, in the church before their, their pastors as, as, as well. And I, th I think you can take that correctly in, in the context of, of what, we're, uh, what we're looking at here and the way in, in which he said it uh, from the, the, the pastors, the evangelists here, to, to the ones they were pastoring, shepherding, evangelizing, discipling, pouring their hearts out and lives out for. Uh, for our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience that and this is the way they lived their, their conversation, in, lived in the world, and to them word, to the saints in Corinth, in simplicity and godly sincerity, uh, not with fleshly wisdom. And Josh, is there any place in the scriptures that, that compares and contrasts uh, wisdom from above with wisdom of the earth? And he's saying, well, yeah, I preached through that, that book, the book of James, so I asked you. And I knew you'd have the right answer. James chapter 3 contrasts those. Uh, who is a wise man and a dude with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good, out of a good conversation, which is what we're talking about, the, the conversation that you have in the world and towards usward, and the conversation that your pastors have in the world and to you word. Uh, out of a good conversation, uh, his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts... Glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, uh, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, uh, gentle, and easy to be entreated, uh, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make 
uh, peace. That is the conversation and, and the wisdom that we're to have uh, one towards uh, another. Paul told the, the saints, the prayers in another church in, in Philippi, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs. So that's another way of the scriptures defining a conversation for us, our affairs. That ye stand fast in one spirit and one mind, striving together, not striving against each other, striving together for the faith of the gospel, uh, Philippians 1 and verse 27. Let me uh, roll into the last section. It all blends together, but verses 13 and 14. Then from the pastors, the prayers. Now we have the, and we already have been talking about it, the partnership between the two. This rejoicing partnership, verses 13 and 14. For we write none other things unto you other than, uh, other than what ye read or acknowledge, and I trust ye shall acknowledge even to the end, as also ye have acknowledged us in part, that we, he says, you've already acknowledged this, that we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. And this is going to sound a little weird, but Paul the evangelist, and we're drawing a parallel to your pastors communicating with the church, uh, <laughs> He says, we are, you're rejoicing. He's basically saying, you've already said this, so I'm just repeating what you've acknowledged. Uh, uh, you have acknowledged us in part that we are your rejoicing, uh, boasting uh, in a good way, uh, glorying. And if you don't feel that way, that, that uh, again, this is weird to say this and preach this as a, one of your pastors. <laughs> so just think, Pastor Sergeant, who's already there at the leadership retreat along with God um, if you don't feel that way that uh, we are your rejoicing pray the more fervently for us isn't that easy well I don't like one of my pastors well pray for whichever one that is that you don't like <laughs> pray for them that much more <laughs> amen uh, and that was the, uh, the testimony that Paul had was you were, you were uh, uh, rejoicing in us because we came and we ministered to you in, in, in the word, able, willing to even give our lives for you that ye might have the life of, of Christ. And then he turns it right back around, and ye also are our uh, rejoicing. And that might sound familiar because he wrote that to another church. And I believe Paul had this heart for every church. Uh, that he wrote to and that he was used to the Lord to establish. It's not like he had this heart for the Corinthians and he didn't for the Thessalonians because to them he wrote in his first letter, uh, for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For ye are our glory and, and joy. And that's what your pastors would say to you. Just like Paul saying, ye are, what's our joy, our rejoicing? You, <laughs> y'all, all y'all. For you Georgians out there, and maybe northern Floridians or whatever, all y'all, Alabamans, you used to live down there, right? That's right. Amen. Rejoicing now, that's taking it a little, a little out of context, making an application. But in context, when is the rejoicing happening? You're looking at me like I'm going to tell you the answer when the answer is in the, the scriptures. Even as ye also are ours, when? In the day of the Lord Jesus. When is that? I don't know. I never took prophecy. Or if I did, I forgot everything I learned. Or I certainly forgot what the day of the Lord Jesus was. I remember maybe having to put it on a chart along with the day of the Lord and the day of Christ and all sorts of other days and time periods, uh, prophetic eschatology, but I don't remember what my chart looks like and, and when the day of the Lord is. So I have a lot of notes on it that I'll not reference other than what's up here. 
Let's start Old Testament, Day of the Lord, all caps, L-O-R-D. Uh, Isaiah, again in my notes somewhere, Isaiah was the first uh, prophet to reference the Day of the Lord. Uh, was that a, a, a happy day or a sad day? And that is the distinction. Uh, the audience said, for the sake of those out there, uh, depends on where you're sitting. And that is the distinction. The day of the Lord that Isaiah speaks of is one of uh, horror, extreme toward uh, Joel. The prophet Joel spoke of the day of the Lord in Isaiah. The Lord coming back, and of First Thessalonians chapter 4, the rapture, we're gloriously out of here. That's why he said, depends on where you're sitting. Well, we won't be sitting down here. We'll be sitting up there. And what's happening down here? Awful, horrendous things. Um, time of uh, Jacob's trouble. The day of the Lord, L-O-R-D, all caps, Old Testament, is, uh, starts, on, uh, starts at the rapture. And it's God dealing with those that have rejected his son, Jesus Christ. Horrible time. You don't want to be here. If you're not saved tonight, please get saved because you don't want to be here for the day of the Lord. Brother Ryan said, but wait a minute, it's not bad if you're up there and not down here. Well, that's what's being referenced here. The day, not the day of the Lord, but the day of the Lord Jesus, or the other places in Scripture, the day of Christ, the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. When does that start? Exact same time at the rapture. Where does that occur? Not down here. That's the day of the Lord. Up there, it's the day of Christ. Why? Because we're going to meet him face to face, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, as the choir sang. You should bring that one back. That was good. Uh, just sing in scripture, the end of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So shall we ever be with the Lord. That's the day of Christ. That's what Paul re is referring to here. There'd be no rejoicing if he was talking about the day of the Lord down here. Oh, it'll be great as God is, is just doing everything possible to, to force Israel uh, to get to the, the end of, of their rope to finally call upon the Lord to, to, to be saved. We don't want to be down here when God is dealing with, with Israel. So the rejoicing is, is up there. He said, oh, but there'll be the judgment seat of Christ up there during the day of Christ. Yeah, but it's not to determine whether you get to stay or if you have to get booted back down here and eventually booted to hell. It's to, to uh, uh, have rewards dished out for faithful service to the Lord and the different crowns and a whole other message. Uh, but then there's, there's a wedding. People like weddings, right? That's, <laughs> the ladies are smiling and the guys aren't. This is hilarious. If you could, if you could have seen the snapshot in time. When, if wedding's exciting, right? The guys are. <laughs> ladies are. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, too funny. Um, and getting me off track, too. So the day of Christ, the wedding, and it's smiling, rejoicing because we're with the Lord. So and that, the day of Christ is up there. The day of the Lord's here. It's going on simultaneously. So it does depend on, on where, where you sit. So this rejoicing partnership that we have is Paul telling uh, the church in Corinth that he's just, hopefully if you're, you're just getting the context of his love for them and their love for, for him. Uh, this rejoicing is, you know, what is my rejoicing? It's when you, Bible Baptist Church Corinth, in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ gets presented to him and and he said you know to another church as as a as a chaste virgin uh no it is to the same church later in the same letter for i am jealous over you with godly jealousy for i have espoused you to one husband that i may present you as a chaste virgin to christ that's what he's talking about this joy when that happens the day of the the rapture and and I, Paul, am there, and I get to see you presented to Jesus Christ, and because of your conversation in this world and towards us uh, living the life of Christ, there's going to be just, that's my joy, the rejoicing of thinking of that moment 
And your excitement should be reciprocal, thinking about your pastors being there with you and saying, these were our, these were our pastors. And the, the pastor's saying, oh, here's your church, Lord. And we've done all this and the washing of the water by the word and, and the, the bride has made herself ready, Revelation chapter 19. That's all this rejoicing that comes about that he's referring to, reciprocal. Uh, as also ye have acknowledged us in our part that we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. Not wrote, Lord, I pray for the leadership retreat. Lord, I pray for my pastors. Lord, I pray for the piano. Lord, I pray for mommy and daddy. Lord, I pray for the pews. Lord, I pray for the violin. Lord, I pray for not that kind of prayer. <laughs> not rote, but rejoicing. Pray for the leadership retreat. Cannot be in word or deed a rote administrative announcement eliciting vain repetitions. Pray for the leadership retreat must be in reality an acknowledgement unto sincere action that while pastors ultimately rely upon the Lord's power even unto death, they are also helped by your needed and coveted prayers. The result is the symbiotic life in the same body whereby we may rejoice one for another in the day of the Lord Jesus. Yes, you can offer prayers that the pastors, staff, and deacons will wisely unite behind a themed focus for 2022 with all of its detailed pieces and parts and events planned for the year. But can I beseech your prayers tonight and beyond tonight? Your prayers beyond the leadership retreat will blink a couple times and it'll be over. It's going to be quick. Your prayers beyond Vision Sunday, this coming Lord's Day, beyond the men's meeting after the Sunday evening service, we look at the finances for 2022 and the general fund and the, the missions plan. Beyond all that, can I ask for your prayers for the leadership team of Bible Baptist Church that our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you, word, by the grace of God, would be and continually be in simplicity and godly sincerity and not with fleshly wisdom. Always that when pressed out of measure above strength, we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. Ye also, helping together by prayer for us. Can I ask you tonight for those prayers? Bible Baptist Church. To the glory of God. Amen.